Primarily because of, uh, well, enterprise middleware. Uh, I mean, that's what Java comes down to, is enterprise middleware. And I don't know about you, but I mean, the days of the, quote, Linux desktop ever being a reality, I think uh, most people have given up on that. And the fact that Linux runs on my phone is pretty cool, but as a Linux administrator, it doesn't really keep me employed. And it's also not that interesting, because it's not a Linux that you can really get in and play with. So Java is actually still very important to the enterprise middleware segment, uh, which is actually, you know, enterprise middleware is also largely uh, behind the success of Linux that you see today. Ten years ago, it was hard to get Linux jobs. Today, you can't get enough Linux administrators. And that's largely because of the success of Linux in the enterprise middleware space. And that is at least in part due to Java itself because of the history. Now, this might seem like an odd reason for Java to still matter, um, the uh, .NET framework, but as many of you may know, .NET in large part was modeled after the Java framework because the Java framework was so successful in that architecture. And .NET has at least been equally successful with that architecture for the enterprise middleware space, but as you know, .NET framework, you know, for all intents and purposes, is not Linux friendly. You know, mono, the mono project aside, you know, you're not really going to see .NET on production enterprise class Linux infrastructure. So, in a way, dot, .NET was modeled after the success of Java, but it also has become its biggest threat. And so Java, from an architecture standpoint, is the only thing on Linux that is comparable to that dot .NET infrastructure or dot, dot .NET architecture. And of course, Java runs equally well on Linux and with it. So Java, I think, is, is important to Linux from this standpoint as well, because it's the only thing like .NET that is going to compete with that. And then I also feel like the OpenJDK is very important to the current success and future success of Java in the Linux environment. Um, OpenJDK has also gotten a little bit of a bad rap over, the, you know, over time, because in the early days of OpenJDK, most people didn't had a lot of problems running it, right? If you ever tried OpenJDK 6, you probably tried it, abandoned it, and went back to the world of JDK, or at that time, the Sun JDK. Um, but the Open JDK, you know, basically, Oracle, you know, Java really is open source now. I mean, that's the other wonderful thing about the Open JDK is that the true upstream to Java is open source, just like Linux. And so that has actually helped to continue to make Java relevant uh, for Linux and. Well, primarily for Linux because OpenJDK only runs on Linux. But I just I think as a platform and a language as well. And then of course, frameworks and toolkits are still why Java matters. That's why Java mattered to begin with is because of the plethora of frameworks and toolkits that were available for Java, and that's still true today. And from that standpoint, you know every buzzword, Java word that you ever you know any one of these. I'm not going to get into any of those, but you know. Any one of these is one reason why Java is still relevant and successful today and will probably continue to be in the future. So what this is not, I always like to start, you know, well, I always like to cover a little bit about what this is not. And like I said earlier, it's not a primer for Java programming. This is not focused for Java programming. This is for Linux system administrators. And it's also not a how-to for Java scripting. I get I see this a lot with um, Java, you know. Linux system administrators that learn a little bit of Java and they're like, ooh, how can I replace my Python scripts with this? And I'm like, nah, it's not really for that. <laughs> so I, I see I see people who think that, you know, and you can do that though. You can write command line CLI top tools in Java. I mean, in fact, when you first start programming in Java, your first Java programs are probably going to be CLI command driven jars and things. So it might be tempting to try that. And you can. You can do it. But no, nah, that's not what this is. It's also not a sales pitch. Even though Java is truly open source, uh, there are a lot of commercial, you know, like enterprise middleware has, is full of a lot of enterprise commercial products. And so it's going to be impossible to avoid or sidestep those. So I'm going to mention some here and there. And this, this is not intended to be a sales pitch of, oh, you should really use this Java management tool. Um, but, you, you know, I do have some biases. So those are going to come out a little bit in the presentation. And I apologize, but yeah, that's what it is. 
So from that standpoint, the application servers, you know, when you're talking about Java as a Linux system administrator, you're almost always invariably talking about some kind of application server, whether that be Tomcat, which is what might be the most prevalent, which or Wildfly, which is more commonly, you know, enterprise is going to be JBoss or application server seven, things like that. Other ones you might be familiar with, IBM WebSphere, obviously, is a big name, Oracle WebLogic. Uh, Glassfish, Apache Geronimo, um, and that is this is true. So if you're dealing with Java in the application middleware space, enterprise middleware space, you're probably dealing with one or more of these things. But what we're going to talk about today actually applies to any of these, as well as anything else. I mean, if if you're running like a, a Java-based LDAP application, you know, directory server or something like um, OpenDJ or something like that, it's it's equally applicable there as well. So what is it about? Um, I don't like to put a lot of verbiage on slides, but this I felt like I, I wanted to say. I, I hate to read to you. I don't like this like intelligence, but you know this is um, basically what it's really about for me for Java and, and, and Linux. It's, it's about the runtime. Um, so Java is both a language and a runtime environment, and it is the intersection between the Java virtual machine and the Linux OS, which I think is of the most interest and concern to the Linux administrators, and an area where Java programmers actually require the most assistance. In my experience, Java programmers are really good about writing Java code, more or less, but they don't necessarily know a whole lot about the operating systems that run underneath them, particularly when that operating system is Linux, where the Java developer may, their primary operating system <coughs> is probably with them, uh, at least on their desktop, if not also their development environment. And so when it comes to memory utilization, memory you know, threading, things like that, they just they don't even know how to communicate to you. <laughs> and that's what this is really about, is, is my experience as a, as a Linux administrator working with these job developers, trying to help them make their code run better, and so they stop thrashing my servers. <laughs> But we need to start with some basics about the the runtime environment. Um, so one of the first questions I get from a lot of Linux administrators is, you know, JDK, JDK versus JRE, what's the difference? You know, the easiest explanation I've seen, and I don't get super technical here, is basically it's 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 just a superset or a subset of the larger. I mean, basically, the JDK, you know, the JRE is a subset of the JDK. It just, the JDK has more commands available to you. The JRE comes with the JDK and it's the runtime environment. But at the heart of it, and this is what's really important, is the JVM hotspot. That's fundamental to both of them. So whether or not you're running the JRE or the JDK, at the heart of it is still the JVM, which, like I said in my previous slide, is what we're really getting to. Um, historically, it used to be that. Um, most application servers require the JDK. Your Java programmer and your system administrator, right? It would be like them coming and saying, I want you to install GCC everywhere, right? <laughs> and of course, you as a Linux administrator said, no, we don't install, install development tools on our production servers. Uh, it used to be that you would actually need to run the JDK even in your production environment. That's less true today. Most of your application servers can run with just the JRE. However, as you might see as part of the presentation, there are still situations where it can be in helpful anyway. Um, so, and there are ways to, there are still ways to get around without it, but the examples that I'm going to show you actually involve or use the JDK, JDK command line tools like JStack and JMap. Um, not the Java C, obviously. The Java C would be the equivalent of compilation. So I'm not going to get into how to install Java specifically. This is more of my recommendations about installing Java. And you know, right off the bat, it's basically, if you can, use the OpenJDK. <laughs> and for anything greater, greater than or equal to Java 7, this should be OK for you. Um, like I said, a lot of Linux administrators have some of, somewhat of a bad experience with OpenJDK, particularly in the early years, because in Java 6, it wasn't really the upstream to Oracle or Sun JDK at that time. It, was, it, it hadn't been fully open yet. But now, 
the open shady k as of Java 7, and, and particularly in Java 8, is the upstream to the Oracle Sun JDK. And although open JDK is not available on Windows, it's really only available on Linux, um, there are reasons and benefits for using the open JDK over using the Oracle uh, binaries. One, you know, a couple of these are, you know, so Oracle actually has to make the JDK available to multiple apps. And the OpenJDK is really only available for Linux, which means that they can tweak and optimize the OpenJDK, particularly the JVM hotspot for Linux. And that is, they, they have done that, they can do that. And so sometimes the hotspot that you're running on there is actually could be a little bit newer, a little bit more stable on Linux. Um, and so it's just worth running it. Um, it's also going to be easier to deploy. Uh, the, the, the tools, the commands are all going to be in nice same locations within your Linux file system. So it's going to be easier to patch and upgrade that system moving forward. Well, now, one of the complaints I hear from some Java developers is, but we develop on Windows and we run the Oracle JDK and our production environment won't be consistent with our development environment. And my answer is, you're developing on Windows and you're deploying to Linux and you're complaining about the JDK is not consistent. <laughs> It's like the entire environment is not going to be consistent if that's your complaint. But for all intents and purposes, I have not seen too many issues with, with you know, Java developers doing Java development on Windows with the Oracle JDK and then moving it to an open JDK on a Linux production environment. And really, you should, you should have some kind of dev or UAT environment between those two places anyway, so they should still be doing some amount of development in a more consistent environment, including the open JDK as well as now, if you can't use the OpenJDK, and unfortunately this is true for some people, um, and biggest reasons that I've seen for not being able to use the OpenJDK primarily center around um, third-party application products that don't officially support the OpenJDK. And so in order to be under support or compliant with their support policies, you, you have no choice. You have to run the Oracle JDK. You can't really run the OpenJDK and still be supported properly by that third party. In those cases, I recommend using a third party channel if, you, if necessary. Now, what I mean by this is if you're a Red Hat customer, they provide a third party channel that provides the binaries that you can install it. And it's basically Red Hat repackages those RPMs in a way that's consistent to the way the OpenJDK was deployed. It makes it easier to deploy and manage that. If you're running an Ubuntu or Debian system, there is a um, uh, a Debian repo for that. It's a little bit different. I think they actually it actually downloads the, the zip deployment of Java, but then just shoves everything in the same locations. And those, those, both of those approaches allow you to use SE alternatives. Where if you don't do that, and you do a direct download from Oracle directly, you're, you're, you're selecting either the RPM deployment or the zip deployment, um, neither of those are going to use SE alternatives, which means you're, you know, you're just stuck in a, in a directory path. And it, it's going to make upgrading, if you're a Linux system administrator of a lot of systems, it just makes patching and upgrading a lot harder. And let's be honest, if you're running Java, you need to be patching your system. <laughs> Everybody sees the security vulnerabilities come out every couple months related to Java. And this is an application server. You need to be patching it. So just be prepared for that. Um, and then I, I also like people to at least consider the OpenJDK. This is something that I've noticed a lot of people just don't, unless they're running IBM hardware or IBM products. They don't even think about the fact that there's a whole other JDK out there available to them above and beyond the OpenJDK and the Oracle JDK. Is the Open, is the IBM has their own JDK, which is again fully compliant with the Oracle with the Java spec. Uh, and in some circumstances, it's worth looking at. Um, I've found circumstances. You know, I, I find less circumstances today than I did a few years ago. It used to be um, if you wanted to run 64-bit, uh, I think it was Java 4 or 5 on a, 60, on a rail 4 or 5 system. It was the only way to get it. Sun didn't make one for Linux uh, or in the early days. You couldn't get a 64-bit Linux. Um, and it was the only way to get a fully supported 64-bit JDK on rail 4 or 5 or whatever. Um, and then today, pretty much 
just use 64-bit. <laughs> it's, it's not even a question. Just use 64-bit. I mean, unless you absolutely just cannot, and you have to use a 32-bit JDK for some, again, some third-party job application that just doesn't support it, or you, I can't imagine in today's day and age that you're stuck on a 32-bit piece of hardware. Uh, but there are just a lot of advantages from a Java standpoint for using 64. So these are my, these are, you know, I'm not going to get into the mechanics of how to install the JDK. I assume all of you know how to install packages. Uh, but these are basically some of my recommendations or guidelines when you are taking a look at it. Now, the basics, yeah, okay, so the rest of this presentation centers around the it's basically what of what the, the memory and the troubleshooting of the, these job application servers. And so when it comes to the basics, basically what I'm going to be providing you here are things like this, which if you've never seen or know what these mean, the XMX and the X, XMS and the XMX. This is one of the first things you're going to run into if you do any kind of job administration for these job developers is uh, basically these two settings. And these are command line options for the Java command. Now, you almost invariably never run Java from the command line, and I'll show you where you would set these variables in a minute. But the first thing you're going to need to be able to do is adjust the size of the memory that you allocate to Java. It's almost invariably the first thing you're going to run into as a, as a Linux administrator needing to do. These are the two settings that you need to set. The S value is the start of the Java memory heap setting. The X is the max. And as an administrator running an application server, I almost always recommend just set them the same. Okay. In a desktop environment, okay, yeah, it's not as important because you want to be able to, you have a start heap size and you want to grow up to a heap size. But in an, app, in an application server environment, there's no benefit to this and there's actually reasons why it's not good. You just, just trust me on this. I've argued with Java developers on this. <laughs> just set them the same. Keep them the same. If you need two gig, set up the two gig, stay there. And I'll explain why in a, in a minute. Um, okay, I actually picked it, yeah. Now, I'm going to put two of these up. So, the next thing you might run into is the garbage collector. So, you got set your heap sizes, set your memory sizes, and then you got how do I garbage collect that? Now, by default, if you don't set anything, you're just going to get the default garbage collector for top, which may or may not be ideally suited for your environment. So you're probably going to want to be able to set these two guys. Um, and when you see parallel old GC, this is not the old method of doing garbage collection. That was the first thing. But when I was just starting, I was like, oh, I don't want the old one. I want the new one. <laughs> it, it has nothing to do with this is the old way of doing it. It has to do with the the area of memory that it does the collecting from, and I'll show you that in a minute as well. By default, I believe Java still uses the concurrent mark sweep. Is that somebody correct me if I'm wrong? I believe by default the Java the JVM will use the concurrent mark sweep, which I believe is actually more ideally suited for desktop environments or application type things. And so, from a server standpoint, you're almost always going to want to set these two guys. Um, unless you're even more aggressive than that, they actually have a new way of doing it that you just say aggressive options and it does all the new fancy stuff. Uh, but this is this one's pretty much, uh, these two are pretty common. These are what you're going to want to do. Basically what this means is, use if you're on a server, it's assuming you're on a server with a lot of cores, and it basically just says, use more than one core to do your garbage collection, which sounds like a really good idea, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, and you can actually, if you have multiple instances of Java running on the same machine and you have a set number of cores, you can even control how many cores each instance of Java uses. So if you if you want to use the parallel GC and you have eight cores, but you only want to use four of them, you can tell just to use four. Now, if you're going to do this garbage collection, you probably ought to get an idea of how well the garbage collection is working. And this is another option that I see in a lot of environments that is not set. And basically, the dash for most GC actually has additional options that I'll show you in a moment. Of, you know, but basically, the bottom line is enable uh, verbose garbage collection logging. Okay, it is it doesn't have? I mean, it, it doesn't add that much overhead, and it, it's entire. It's incredibly valuable when you need it. So it's worth 
turning on that login for yourself as an administrator to figure out when you are having problems with the Java application server crashing your system, this is one of the things you're going to want to look at. And you're not going to be able to if you don't have it turned on. And the overhead for it isn't that bad. It's worth doing. Um, it's just worth doing across the board. It's not like Debo, though. And then the other, finally, the other, the other thing that can really help from a performance standpoint, which you may not run into as early as setting memory and garbage collection and things like that, is uh, using with large pages. Now, I had to cut some things for this presentation. I didn't get into a lot of detail about how to set the, system, the Linux system uh, kernel parameters on how to set up large pages, but you know, I'll leave that for you to Google. It's pretty easy to figure out. It's not that hard. Um, and in more modern systems like Rails 7, they have this thing called transparent huge pages, which tries to do this automatically for you, and it does okay. Uh, the general recommendation from an application server standpoint, though, is if you are running a Java application server with this, and you're allocating a significant amount of RAM to that application server, you might want to set up your, your large pages statically. Um, it's going to be more efficient than relying on the transparent huge pages, which you have no real control over. And there are still, I believe, some known issues with the transparent huge pages for these large application servers and the use of the, of the large pages. So does anyone know what large pages is? Does, do I need to explain that? I think maybe I do. So in the Linux, you know, in the Linux operating system, it does its own memory management, right? It does its own memory management. And so it scours the memory for objects to get cleaned up from its memory. Well, Java, in the way Java likes to do things, it likes to do everything itself. You know, it has its own network stack, it has its own everything. Uh, it has its own memory management, its own memory cleanup. Um, so when you have the operating system trying to manage that memory, and you have Linux, the Java trying to manage that memory, that's a, a waste of compute res you know, resources. Reset. So what you can do is in the Linux, kernel, you can actually set, you can allocate large memory blocks where it says, okay, basically just tell, it basically just tells the Linux operating system, don't work as hard on these memory blocks because the application is going to be cleaning that memory for you. That's all it really does. And it, it really is a, uh, if you're running a JVM with a heap size of at least two gig or higher, they can become quite easier. If, if, you're, if all your JVM heaps are under two gig, don't worry about it. Not a big deal, one way or the other. So let's talk a little bit about what all that memory makes. Now this is a really watered down, oversimplified version of the, the JVM memory model. Um, but I think it's important to understand uh, some of the, at least some of these spaces and where they relate to the application server and your Linux operating system. So in the, uh, down here, this bar here represents those XMS and XMX settings that I was talking about, is whatever you set those two, that's this, these two blocks combined, more or less. Now there's a couple other slivers of memory in here that I don't get into in detail, but that's what it comes down to. And when you set these two things as different values, what happens is, is when you start at the JVM, it might start down here at the XMS value, but then it'll, you know, when it hits that wall, It'll scale up to the, you know, all the way up to the larger value as it needs it. Well, every time it has to increase that size, the this the size of the Eden space and some of these other memory blocks in here are all set when you start the JVM based on the total size of your memory. Well, when the memory when the whole heap resizes, it has to readjust all those sizes and calculations on when it does these different collections. That's why. If you're going to run a, a, a server, that, if it needs, if you know it needs two gigs of memory, just set it that way to begin with. Because if you actually need it, it's going to get there. You're wasting time having it do all this extra work. Just set them both the same, have it get up here, and then it will it will preset the other sizes of memory blocks that it wants from the get go, and it won't have to do all that work when it does the resizes. Now. So when I was when we were looking at the parallel collectors and the old parallel collectors, that's what this comes down to is. So you get a lot of uh, small garbage collections that happen in here, and then you get your major garbage collections happen in here, and, and this is basically your old memory. So it's how it's collecting the old memory and those full collections. The minor collections are usually really small, really quick. You barely even notice them. 
in the parallel collector, the full collection is like a stock the world collector. Um, I mean, unlike the concurrent mark sweep where it's a low pause collector, the parallel collector is a pause collector, but it's uh, a high throughput collector, which is why if you can, you have a lot of cores, give it a lot of cores, because you don't want it to slow you down any When it happens, you don't want it to have to slow you down any more than it absolutely needs to, because that will, everything's going to stop <laughs> for a brief second when that full collection happens. Um, now there's also, I didn't even put it in that other slide at all, there's this little XM, I don't even remember what it says there. Huh? In. I've never said this, and I don't recommend getting into there. Uh, when you when you start doing garbage collection analysis, a lot of people get really um, they go a little over. <laughs> right? At the end of the day, when you're doing garbage collection analysis, and we'll take a look at the, what a, a GC log looks like in a second. Um, really, what it comes down to is you want to figure out is the overall size of my heap adequate, and am I using the right collection? And am I getting enough people? When you get into micromanaging the sizes of these sub containers, you probably are going to do more harm than good. I mean, just quite honestly, I mean, unless you really know what you're doing, you're probably overthinking the problem. So just set your total size and heap sizes appropriately, use the correct collector, use multiple cores, you know, whatever it is you can do to optimize and make your garbage collection run better. It, you're going to get better performance for the applications here, and your 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 um, Java developer will be much happier. Now, there's also this other thing you tend to run into over here. Uh, you may or may not have seen in your log messages uh, out of perm gen space, right? Well, that's this guy over here. And you notice he's actually not part of these memory blocks. He's completely separate from those. And you can actually set the size of him separately. You can actually set the perm size and the max perm size space for this. Uh, memory separately. So that is in addition to the heap size. So if you set your heap size to 2 gig and you set your perm gen size to 512, your total memory consumption of that JVM is 2.5 gig, right? Well, no, it's actually more than that, which I don't even get into in this slide. There's also native threads that you have to take into consideration on top of this, which also consume memory on your system. So when you're taking a look at top of whatever and you're trying to figure out Okay, I've allocated two gig of heat to this JVM. Why is it using three? <laughs> right? Well, it's because you've got perm gen space on top of that heat, and you've got native threads, which are completely outside of the JVM memory space entirely. Um, so if you try to correlate or make sense between Java memory and native system memory, that's probably what you're seeing. I get Java, I get Java developers actually questioning me on this. Um, they're like, well, we set our heat to one and a half gig. Why is it using two? Because you got more than just the heat to worry about. At least I have more than the heat to worry about. Apparently you didn't. Um, but anyway. So where do you set these things? Oh. So what's that perm thing used for? Okay, uh, very, very good question. What is the perm gen use space used for? Basically, it's memory that's so, been around so long, it's obviously been around so long, it's never gone away. We're throwing it in perm gen, it never really gets cleaned. They don't even, it doesn't even try to clean the data. It stays in permanent memory. This really only happens really for like uh, usually parts of the container will end up there because you know they just it's all they're always there in memory and it just it doesn't even need to try to clean them anymore so it stays in perm. And you could there now there are, technically there are ways you can force cleaning of the perm gen space, but that's not really what it's intended for. I and mean, you, you can do that usually if you're running out of perm gen space, you just need to increase it a little bit, or you need to figure out. You may, I mean, you may need to have your job developer take a look at why they have so much stuff hanging around in perm gen. Um, I've never had a problem with just doubling the space size of perm gen. The default, I think, is like 256. And I've usually, I mean, at worst case scenario, I've had to go to 512 for some big application servers. If you get beyond that, you, you might ask your job developers to really consider what they have hanging around in memory. And we might need to take a look at the uh, adult of the memory. And I'll show you how we can get some of that in a minute. Um, because if you get, in, I mean, if you have a perm gen space that's rivaling the size of your heap, something's wrong, right? <laughs> so, so, and we can get to that in a second. So where do you set all these nice options? Um, and this is another thing that's really frustrating or confusing for some Linux administrators new to Java. And it's like, well, all these Java options are command line options. 
so you know if you were to actually start this program by command line it would be java option 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 like 50 options long and then the name of a jar file or a program right that's just not a very convenient way to start a java application server which is why almost all java programs have some kind of shell script wrapper around them which is just it you know, we, we experience that in the Linux community as well with uh, System 5 init scripts, for example. I mean, so that's not that uncommon, but it's even worse in Java, where you might have a System 5 init script that basically just calls another shell script. In fact, that shell script could call 10 more shell scripts. For example, in the, if you download the Tomcat uh, zip file, its bin directory is just a bunch of shell scripts that call each other and source each other. And it can get really confusing and annoying. Well, somewhere, in that mess of shell scripts, uh, preferably if you're if you're running a nice R Red Hat deployed version or Fedora deployed version, they might put it somewhere nice and convenient like Sysconfig. It's going to contain uh, a file in there that contains you know all those options, or, or an ability to set or add all those options to this command line option. So you can you know, usually you'll you'll find it in a file that already has an XMS and an XMX possibly already set to pre some preset value, and all you have to do is go in there and change the value. Usually in that same location, you can add additional options, like, for example, setting explicitly setting a garbage collector or adding verbose logging. Um, so what you want to do is look for one of these files. It could be in sysconfig. Uh, again, these are all examples more or less from Tomcat. It could be in a set environment.sh, or worst case scenario, it could be in a cat in, right in the Catalina.sh sometimes. Um, or even worse, worst case scenarios, that you might even have to go manually modify the system by the script, which is not recommended. I mean, usually it's going to be in some additional uh, shell script that you get sourced along the way as, as part of starting that application. Now, I also like to include this option, which a lot of people aren't even fully aware of. So you can also pass in a properties file. So you can't set everything in here, but if you do have a lot of system properties that need to be set for your JVM, most of which probably, I, you know, most of the ones that I've covered here, you couldn't even set in this file, but your application developer might have a lot of properties that they need to set. Uh, if, you, if you set all those on the command line and you do a PS output, that output can look really ugly. Uh, you can actually shove them into a property file too, so a lot of the system properties you can shove in there uh, and source that. And so on your command line, you would just add this as another command line option in one of these files. Uh, with the path to a property file, you can add it, pass in dozens, even uh, additional Java properties specific to that application. So, one of the first things I've said that a lot, it must be one of the second or third things now. Um, you might run into, we talked a lot about memory. Another thing you might run into is you're going along and all of a sudden, you get an alert from your monitoring system. System is running high CPU. You go to take a look at it, and it's the Java process. Like, okay, why is this Java process killing my system? So you go to the Java developer, and he's like, what's going on? He's like, I don't know, restart it. So you restart it, it goes away, and you have no idea what's going on, what happened. So the easy, it's actually really easy to, to figure out what in that Java stack was running high CPU. If you're just looking at the regular PS out in a top output, it's just going to be one line from Java. But this is just a really handy top option to do. Basically, what these mean is you're running top in batch mode. You're going to run one iteration, but you might want to do this multiple times. But you know, in, in this batch mode, we're just going to do one iteration. And basically, we're going to provide the process ID of your Java process. You're going to need to do a PS, figure out what your, the PID of your Java process is. And what this is going to do is it's going to give you all of the child processes for that Java process, not just this one liner that you've had before. And it's also going to sort it by which ones are using the most CPU. Now, at the same time you do this, or very shortly thereafter, you're going to want to run a, uh, a thread dump. And you can do that very easily with jstack-l, and again, the process ID of the Java process. So you're going to get these two outputs. Now this one, you really need to run it as whatever the application server is running. So if you're running Tomcat and it's running as Tomcat, you need to run it as Tomcat. Even if that, if it means you have to do sudo-u tomcat, 
do that. But you're going to get these two outputs, this nice top output and this uh, thread dump is what this is. Now there are other ways of getting thread dumps without using JSTack. Now you might remember JSTack was one of those commands that was in the JDK, not the JRE. So if you're just running the JRE, you're not going to have JSTack available. Um, you can get a thread dump um, by, I think it's a, a kill three. We'll, we'll generate a step, we'll also generate a thread dump. But the problem with that is that it's going to generate it into wherever the standard out is being directed for that job process, which if you're running a production application server, might be nowhere, could be dev null. Um, another common recommendation for production application servers is to basically not do console logging because it's duplicitous of the Java logging usually, and it's usually not all that useful. And it's just gonna it doesn't rotate and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Can you rewrite that output to say a lot of standard error? Oh to standard error. Actually I think it is does actually go to standard error or does it go to standard I'm not sure. Okay. But uh, usually I'm not sure which at the moment right now the, the, the dash the kill three goes to, but new, usually both of those things get thrown away. If you're not if unless you're unless you're doing console logging. Like if you're on a Tomcat, that's usually capturing it out. Okay, so by default, Tomcat, it's probably already going to be there. So if you just do a kill three on it, you'll get a thread dump without necessarily having JSTAC installed. Yeah, um, and then you you can take that. And now this this is when this is the part of the presentation where I'm going to show you some really cool applications that you can then use to do some of this debugging. And this is one of the first ones, the TDA. This is actually the thread dump analyzer. That's what it's known as. Um, and it's actually getting quite, quite old. <laughs> it, I haven't seen it been updated in a while, but it's still very useful. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't lessened in its us usability at all. Uh, and I'll show you a screenshot of what that looks like and how you can take these two things and compare them together. So this is an abbreviated version of what your top output would look like from that first command. It's going to look like this. So you'll see the process ID. Um, um, do I see my parent These are all your child processes of that parent of that um, parent Java kid that we ran it on. So whatever you put in here, he's running a whole bunch of children, and these are his actual processes and IDs of his children. And then you'll normally see over here the high CPU. Now these really aren't that high. Normally what you'll see is you'll see like a hundred percent on one on the first line or the first two lines. So you'll see you'll have one or two or even three PIDs running at 100%. And if you're on a multi-core system, that means they just have one of those cores pegged and they're not letting it go. And what you want to do is you probably want to take both these commands and run them in a loop. So you might want to take two or three iterations every 30 to 60 seconds to see that your comes. You know what you'll probably see is if your if your if your Linux server is pegged at a high CPU, one or more of these PIDs is not changing and it's staying at 100% CPU and it's not going away over time. So over multiple iterations of that, yes? No, if you do it at the top normally, just type in top and you get a nice little screen view, you don't see all those sub-child processes. All you're going to get is the one line for Java saying it's eating 100% CPU. Or actually, if you're a multi-core system, you can even see it say 200 or 300 or 400 percent CPU because it's locked up three or four cores. But it will respond to give you a higher level of the system itself. Yes, it gives you all the processes okay. and stuff. Yeah, this bat, like I said, this is batch mode one iteration by a specific parent PID, and what it's going to do is it's going to give you all the child processes of that Java process, which is what we're going for here, because we want to see what inside the JVM is actually causing the high CPU. You know, previously you might just say, Java's crashing my system, I don't know why. You go to the Java developer, I don't know why. <laughs> and you just restart the Java process and it goes away and everybody's happy, but you still have no idea what just happened. So you take this output and you figure out what these PIDs are. You get some of these native PIDs. And then you take that stack trace that we took from Java and you open it in the analyzer, which is a desktop tool. And you're going to get there's a column in there that has the native ID. And if you take that, and you take this column here, and you correlate what the high one was from top, but rather from here, it's going to tell you exactly what inside the JVM that was doing. Now, this is kind of blurry, so you can't really see it. I think this example here actually specifies an HTTP connector. 
So you could actually take that and correlate it back to an access log, like a Tomcat access log, or let's say if you're fronting Tomcat with Apache, this might be a, um, instead of an HTTP one, it might be a, J, a, a AJP connection set here. You can correlate that all the way back to a web access log and figure out what post call actually initiated that. So you can figure out what client, when they hit the server, what the URL was, what the post data was, and now you can take that information back to your developer and say, this is what killed my system. Right? Now that's kind of useful, right? Uh, uh, you know, not only did you isolate it down for the job of the application developer, now they have something useful they can go and figure out what in their code might be causing that. That's very helpful to them and to you because it means it might actually get fixed. Now another thing that you might see here, so you might see like a web connector, you might see a database connector. Yeah, that would be helpful. Or you might actually see, uh, in some cases, you might actually see, you might actually trace this back to the garbage collector itself. I've seen that too. Now that doesn't mean that your garbage collector is wildly out of control and there's a problem. It probably means your heap size isn't big enough. And you haven't got an OOM or out of memory area yet because the garbage collector is just trying really, 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 really hard to keep your memory clean. That's what it probably means. Uh, and so if you see high CPU and it's because of your garbage collector here, now's when that garbage collection logging could come in really handy if you have it turned on. So we're going to talk about GC logging. <laughs> so this is more what you, you, know, you would actually have to set all three or four of these options to get good GC logging for your application. So remember that environment, uh, set environment.sh in there, you're actually going to have to set like four options. Um, to get good GC logging. So you turn it on, um, you give it a, and this is basically telling it what the name of the log file. So this could be a path into, and then what I, I like to do is I put in a date. So Sam, the garbage collection log does not get rotated. Um, and it, and it's, so as soon as you start the JVM, it's going to start logging that GC log. It never rotates, it just continues to grow. But I've never seen it get so bad that it's gotten that big. It, 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 it's not terrible. And if you have a running Java, you're probably having to patch, so you're probably having to restart every now and then again anyway, and it's going to rotate. But if you don't put some kind of date variable in the name, it's going to clobber the last file. So it's a good idea to put that. Now I like to put the dash, this uh, formatting option for date, which is, a, if you're familiar with the date command, is UTC settings, right? Which is kind of handy because even though you tell it to print timestamps, it's in seconds since the JVM was started, which isn't terribly helpful unless you know exactly when the JVM was started. So if you have UTC seconds, and you can add the seconds from the log file, you have a UTC second string of exactly when those events happened in the log, and it's really to convert that bit to a date timestamp of when it is in the log, because it could have been several days after the JVM actually started. Now this is really hard to read too, but this is a typical GC output. Um, and I'm not going to get into too much of the details here because what I'm really going to tell you is you're going to want to use some tool to help you analyze this. Um, but really all it's doing is you'll see these timestamps and you'll see minor collections and you'll see basically how long it took to do the collection. And at some point down here you'll see I have at least one in here, I'm sure. These are all minor collections, I think. I don't see any full collections. Huh. That's, I need to fix that slide. At some point you're in here, you're going to see a full collection. And that full collection is going to be a lot longer. You can, uh, you can do the, the date stamps. Oh, can I do that? Yeah, there's a print date stamps on me. Red Hat actually told us when we were in troubleshooting. That, that, does it do seconds or does it actually do time? No, that should do the date, time, or like a year. There is an option for that now? Yeah. Cool, I'll look at that. Um, very good enough. Um, at some point, you're going to get a full collection in here. Now, if you remember that last slide, if I said you were doing high CPU and you noticed it was the guard after doing it, what you're probably going to see is a lot of full GCs in here taking time. And you don't really want to see a whole bunch of full garbage collections happening with regular number. Like, for example, in a JBoss environment, it, it automatically does a full garbage collection once an hour. I rarely ever saw one more than frequently than that. Unless they, you know, there might have been a minor spike in memory 
for some query or whatever they did, and then they had an additional full DC. But if you see a lot of full DCs in here, you probably need to adjust the size of your footprint. Um, if not, uh, actually go have your developers figure out why they're using so much memory. Which I'll show you some ways that we can help them do that in a moment as well. Yes? The uh, rule of thumb that I've, I've used, and maybe I've seen it somewhere, is that you don't want more than four seconds per gigabyte of RAM. For the full GCs? Yeah, for the full GCs. That's reasonable. Um, yeah, and you can, I mean, you can get really into even, and this is where when you start analyzing this data, it actually shows you every single little memory bucket. And this is where people start doing this, like, oh, well, I need to adjust the size of this. And that's why I, like, I don't recommend getting too nitpicky. It's usually just increase the size. Now, if you get into a situation where it's taking more than four seconds per gigabyte of, is that, is that heap or RAM? Uh, heap. heap, okay. If it's taking, you probably, it, you, I'm guessing you probably aren't running the parallel collector and you need to be and give it more force. <laughs> Does that sound right to you? Yeah, I mean, and, and sometimes it's just that how we're the you know, out of the box application. Yes, out of the box. If you didn't set the garbage collector, you probably run concurrent hard sweep, which if you're an application server, probably isn't what you want. Um, but yeah, garbage collection is really most people would just call it voodoo science, <laughs> voodoo magic, and it's also funny. Interestingly enough. This is one area where I don't think they do enough time. Oh, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to speed up. The I don't think the they spend enough time talking about this in uh, school for the job development. They learn how to write Java programming, but they don't learn this. And this is where I think, as an administrator, you, you really have an opportunity to help them because it, this is not Java. This is basic system administration uh, at a JVM level. I mean, the JVM is just is like a, it's a virtual machine. Not on different life than what we deal with on a different everyday basis. It's just different tools, different language, but at the end of the day, it's a virtual machine with memory and processing. So I think as administrators, we have a lot that we can help. So I'm gonna have to speed up here. Sorry guys. Um, so the GC analysis, Red Hat actually has a really good tool that you can just take that GC log, drop it on a web page, and it'll actually help you analyze that file. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, that's the only tool that I know out there that is really kind of current. There's a couple other GUI tools or command line tools, uh, Garbage Cat and GC Viewer. They'll give you some basic stats on it and give you know give you an idea on what your throughput looks like. But they don't they're not going to give you a whole lot of good recommendations. Um, unfortunately, the Red Hat Access one you know requires an account with Red Hat, at least a account. And FYI, their developer accounts ninety nine dollars a year. It's worth it even if you don't have anything else. <laughs> um, so I need to run through heat dumps real quick <laughs> because I'm really running out of time. So heat dumps, unlike thread dumps, not only are you getting all the threads, but you're actually getting all the memory information too. So if you find out from a garbage collection standpoint that you're, filling, you're using up all your heat, you're running out of memory, you're maybe getting OLM errors in your logs, um, you can always just raise the ceiling on them, give them more heat, but you know if you're already running 12 gig heat, maybe you actually want them to maybe figure out why they're using it at all. Um, so there are a couple different ways. One thing that's really handy, it's another JVM option, is to set that if you do get an out of memory error, OOM, it will just automatically create a heat dump for you. That's a good thing to have when you have those kind of errors to figure out what went wrong. And of course, you also for that have to tell where to dump it. Otherwise, you can just dump it to wherever it wants to, which is usually wherever the bin is running from. So. Wherever the process, wherever you seed it into before you started the process, as part of those shell scripts, that's where it's going to you have to dump that heat, and you're not going to have any control over the name or anything. But you can also at any time manually create a heat dump, which if you're trying to analyze a problem that isn't to the point where it's creating OOMs, and you just want to figure out, okay, do, is there something we can do here to get the developers to reduce their memory, or maybe they have a memory leak. You know, it's like you're hitting them over time, and you you know it grows. And you haven't hit it yet, but you can create a heat dump at any time, and you can figure out maybe I've got a memory leak here. And again, there's another great tool for that, and this one is a lot better than the TDA. The MAT, the, the, uh, the memory analyzer tool, is basically an Eclipse RCP. Um, so it, it's an Eclipse, if, you, or if you're familiar with Eclipse IDE, but it's customized just to do this one function. 
and that is to parse and analyze ketones. Oh wow, did I lose my color? Okay. Now, so basically you just open that heat dump with this tool. Now, FYI, wherever you run this tool from needs to be running the same version of Java that the heat dump came from. So if that's a 64-bit job, you know, Oracle JDK 7. whatever, you need to have a 64-bit Oracle JDK on your machine to analyze this. Have the same release version as the server, ideally. Uh, which means on your desktop you might have a whole bunch of zip deployments of Java laying around just to support this. Yes? So the higher level would not compensate the lower level? Like not able, they're not compatible with the lower level? Um, I believe, I mean, it, to a certain extent, you can get away with that. Like, if you're running a slightly newer Java on your desktop, it would be okay. But it's it's a good idea if you're doing heap analysis to use the exact same version of whatever it came from. Um, you're certainly not going to want to run eight to analyze a seven. Um, but anyway, there's a really good tool in here. Without getting too far into this tool, you can it, you just click on detect leaks, and it'll give you the 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 biggest leak you know suspects. And it's really just by size on heap. So the biggest, it's going to take a look at the biggest objects in the heap, and it's going to rank them and tell you what are the what's what's consuming the most memory resources. In some cases, that might be the container, which means you probably don't have a leak. But if it's a database object, that seems like a bad idea. And you can you can see uh, you can quickly isolate where you might be having a leak. Uh, I'll give one quick example. Um, for example, back when I was running my Tom, Tom, Tomcat four days. We had a situation where we just had, knew we had to reboot the Tomcat, restart Tomcat servers every few minutes. Well, we started getting an influx of traffic, and it started happening more frequently. We had to restart the Tomcats more often, and it got to the point where our traffic was so high that we were restarting, restarting the Tomcat multiple times a day. Heat dump. It was the logger, the the Tomcat logger. Turns out, hey, yeah, there's a well-known memory leak in the logger. Upgrade to Tomcat, went away. It was fine. Uh, so you can you can get you can it's very helpful for you and for the job developer to isolate where they might be having memory consumption problems, and you can point right to a specific Java class or call that that has that memory still stuck in uh, heat. Uh, I also wanted to get through some tools. I'm probably not going to have time to get through them all. Um, J Console is a great tool. Um, Visual VM is the newer iteration of the J Console. Uh, these can run both locally and remotely. If you're doing them remotely, you need to be running JMX. I'm going to be going through it here real fast, guys. Sorry. Um, setting up JMX can be a little challenging. It's 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 really simple at one point, but really you need to you know here's the simplest way to get up and running really fast, quick, and dirty without any security at all. If you want to set, up, but you really need to set up some security, at least some kind of password, some kind of encryption to do it properly. See the documentation. I didn't want to get it. To the nitty gritty details of setting up a key store and all that. Another option is for remote monitoring of the of the Java processes to for those things would be SNMP for Java. A real again a real easy thing to set up and enable. You'll notice that it uses a different port than the system. This uh, SNMP is not going to leverage the system's SNMP. It's going to want to do its own, just like Java does for everything, right? Its own network stack. So then you can take uh, either one of those two solutions, either JMX or uh, SNMP, and use any one of your favorite monitoring tools to then monitor some of those statistics. So you can see, for example, you can monitor the thread usage. So you can see maybe you have a thread leak going on, or you can see the memory usage over time, which is a very handy thing to do. Um, so as a system administrator, you probably are already using one of these tools already, if not something similar. Uh, personally. I, I I mean I like Xenos a lot, so there was a Xenos presentation yesterday, and it has uh, some built-in Zen packs for J Java and even tools like J uh, Tomcat and JBoss that use JMX out of the box. If you're able to, I do recommend JMX over SNMP; it's more capable. Uh, but then there's also even more specific Java monitoring tools like the, the CA Wiley Interscope product, uh, RHQ. From, which is as and the red hat is known as John. And now, if you are able to run an OpenJDK, there's even a great solution called Thermostat, which is really good. The problem: all of these are more agent-based, so these are these are agent lists. So you just have to enable the connector. These actually require installing some kind of Java agent on the machine. But the, the advantage of it is, is if you have multiple JVMs.
Here you would actually have to set a different SMP per SJVM. Here you'd actually be able to run one agent, one TCP, monitor all the JVMs on that machine. And this is what our HQ or DOM would look like. And you can actually do a lot more with it than just monitoring. And then we are unfortunately out of time for questions. <laughs> I apologize. Bar the door. Huh? Bar the door. Sorry. We can get along. I actually have a lot more stuff I wanted to put in this presentation, too. Uh, even more dynamic specific, like using LSOF, using NetStat, or better than the new RSSS stuff. Or, in fact, I had to figure out, I had a, just Thursday, I was using LSOF to try to figure out, uh, help a Java developer figure out their socket. They had a socket leak. They weren't closing their sockets, and they had a lot of, they were ended up using up all their file descriptors because they weren't closing their sockets. <laughs> What did you recommend for all this other information? Okay, I get that a lot. Um, there are a couple Java books out there for this like focus. Um, not very many, I, and that's why I, I get this question a lot. Like everyone's like, recommend a good book to me. There aren't any. <laughs> There's a couple of Java performance tuning books out there. Uh, nothing specific to Linux. I've actually I've actually been contemplating writing something like a free one or starting a free one for job just Java on Linux for system administrators. Uh, maybe getting some contributors out there because it, it, it is enough. I think it's. It needs to be out there. And so that's one of the reasons I want to put together the presentation is to kind of get it out here, get a start, get an idea of some of the things that need to be covered, uh, get some feedback, maybe start writing a book. It's surprising since, you know, most of Google and it's like every, like Hadoop. Yep. I mean, the whole thing is Java. Yep. Linux. Yep. Yeah. Huh? I work at Secure24, it's a cloud hosting company. You've heard of it?
Thank <laughs> you.